and the only part of astronomy that i understand is orion's belt because okay. it's so identifiable the three yeah, stars yeah. are just like in one line so i in the spiritual conspiracy mm-hmm. theories i found out that uh, it's something related to the alignment of the pyramids as well these stars are project- projected in the sky they're not at the same distance what they're not at the same distance they can be at different distances what i have understood with this orion connection between orion and the pyramids of egypt is that the nile floods in a particular uh, uh, season so they wanted to figure out when there's orion rises in the east Ooh. that is when the nile floods so okay. their calendar and then the identifying the there are some particular holes in that directly you can see at that position orion coming up the black holes are of different types like you know stellar black holes where like you know this is a serious case where you have a star and a white dwarf white dwarf is basically the remnant of a star black hole is what physics mean, means that the density is so high that the light cannot escape you cannot see it so you have to detect it in a indirect fashion where this the star which is going around the invisible black hole ah yeah so that is how we estimate that there is a huge mass present in a small volume that could be a wow uh, uh, black hole it's a conversation with one of the country's leading astrophysicists this is dr annapurni subramanyam who's the director of the indian institute of astrophysics asked her everything from details about the center of the milky way to details about our own solar system to details about science even discuss time travel and interstellar but if you're someone who enjoys our astrophysics conversations you're going to have a ball listening to this one i had a blast recording it for you guys enjoy the science special of trs it's a heavy episode but it's an episode that will stay with you for a very long time dr anapurni subramanyam i'm so honored to be hosting you on trs How are you ma'am? I'm good and thank you so much for inviting me on the show. It's genuinely our honor. Uh I didn't thank even you. know that there's an Indian Institute of Astrophysics until fairly recently and with everything that's happened with Chandrayaan 3 and this general revolution of science that we're seeing in India, I've decided that now it's time for all the great scientists of our country to be on TRS. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to listening to more scientists on TRS. Okay, is it yeah. true that many scientists take up the job profile of being a scientist because of their love for science fiction? I've seen this a lot. So, was that true for you as well? Uh, not really, but uh, the uh, they do take up the uh, job because or rather the that particular route because they're passionate about it. So okay. how they got into it could be of different reasons but of course science fiction is definitely a reason. Yes. Okay. 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 Why don't we explain what astrophysics is? What is astrophysics? Okay. So astrophysics is uh, um uh astro and physics together. So it's a combination of astronomy and physics, let me put it that way. So astronomy is uh, an ancient science. where you actually look at the sky and uh, patterns of the sky including the star moon etc and then physics comes into explaining why are they the way they are the sun is there why is the sun uh, uh, the way it is why how is sun able to uh, uh, shed light and energy for such a long duration and still be the same right and why is moon not able to produce its own light why is it only reflecting the light so why are the stars nearby the way they are where how are they how far are they so these questions once you start asking questions in terms of why then you have to bring in physics and also mathematics why mathematics mathematics because why are they going in circles and what is the radius of the circle is it circle or ellipse mm and then the angles if you want to actually measure the distance between they are all on a curved uh, because it's a it's at the angle it's not like they are not traveling in straight lines thing so you need to look at mathematic mathematical solutions to it so maths and physics come in so then you are looking at the why why is the way it is and wh- what is actually happening and uh, if you know it is then the physics astrophysics come in to understand the uh, uh 
our uh, planet. I mean, planet basically it becomes Earth sciences, and uh, you start looking at planetary sciences. Then it becomes the our planets around us and nearby solar system. Astrophysics is generally little beyond that over the sun and the heliosphere. Heliosphere would mean that the entire sun and the sun, the region which is con, uh, uh, which has impact from the sun. So it's called heliosphere. Like up till Pluto. Uh, yeah, it's, it could be beyond also. The, the solar, okay. the wind from the sun keeps going. So it, it can go to f very far distances. So heliosphere encroaches everything. And then the beyond the nearby stars, and then it becomes the galaxy, and then the uh, uh, far beyond, yeah. And the beginning <laughs> of the universe and cosmology, yeah, yeah. My very educated mother just showed us nine planets. So that's Mercury, Venus, Earth, yeah, Mars... Yeah. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Saturn Uranus, Uranus, Neptune. Uranus, Neptune Pluto, Pluto is not a planet anymore. It is actually looking as a dwarf planet. Okay. Uh, so when I was in school and when uh, I think uh, I was in even in PhD time, it was still, still considered as a um, planet. No, we don't consider that as a planet. We call it as a dwarf planet. The reason being... Um, it's interesting that in the last 25 years or so, I think, or a little more than that, we now know that other stars have planets. Till then, we, we, we knew, we can speculate that, like, you know, sun-like stars might have planets or they could be solar system outside. But we didn't know. We, we didn't know in the sense that uh, yeah, you can theorize, but you have no evidence but then the evidence started coming in the last uh, 30 to 25 years. And then we started seeing that at least one planet is around the star. Then now we can say that groups of planets are around stars. So our outside solar systems are there. Then if you look at, then you start calibrating your, comparing your solar system with other solar system. So then if you look at it, then it says that all the planets have to be in the similar plane. Pluto is actually slightly out of the plane. Oh. Yeah. But so it's, it's still revolving around yeah, our yeah, sun, it's, it's, right? Yeah, yeah, it's there. It's a dwarf planet, that's all. So the, it's slight difference in nomenclature when you compare yourself. It's like a near, nearby houses come and you have a house and then you look at the house and okay, you recalibrate yourself kind it, of a thing. Yeah. It's like there's a stereotype in Mumbai that if you're from Thane, you're not really from Mumbai. <laughs> anyway, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Uh, I don't believe that. I think Thane people are from Mumbai. Uh, my point is... Uh, do we know everything about our solar system? No. So, okay. Someone had actually pitched this on the show. I think it was Abhijit Chawda. He said that there could even be more planets around our sun, which are revolving around our sun, which maybe we've not discovered. Is that true or not? Um, there is a possibility of another planet, which is actually uh, 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 possible in the sense that there is some... So how do you know there are how many planets are there? How the heck are you going to say that there is another one more or ten more or how are you go, how are you even finding out that right? So there are orbital calculations you do, just like the way you orbital calculations for you know from here to Mars if you want to travel. How do you how much force you have to put? So if you put the force, you actually reach there. So that means you have calculated the parameters, which including the distance, the mass, everything is correct. But when you do this orbital dynamics and you don't have to actually go there, but then predict that everything orbit is actually coming, closing, there would be, uh, there would be errors or there would be, uh, let's say, um, uh, when you actually have a model and the observation, you compare it, there will be residual. We call it as a residual. As in gravitational pull is happening because of something, but yeah, you don't so know Your what. theory is not completely correct with the observation. Something is missing. Okay. So then that in that mismatch can be said that maybe because of something which is we have not accounted for something. Okay. And wow. that is basically prob possible that yeah. Okay. So you're saying that when you apply mathematics to our solar system, yeah. there is a lot of factors that come into play, orbital length, gravitational pull, etc. Yes, yes. And when you guys as astrophysicists deep dive into this mathematics, there is some unknown factor which is causing a residual gravitational pull or affecting the other yes, planets. Yes, the model is not model is not matching with the uh, data. So what basically in astronomy we does we do is it's not like in laboratory where you can actually do it and wait and say that and all that, yeah. right? So you get the data and then you have to have a model 
theory that this is how it is physics based theory and mathematics based theory this is my model is it has to fit it okay so then you actually say that okay at this time the the pluto has to come back to this for example has to come back to this exact point with this ex exact uh, uh, precision now according to your theory this is what is predicted but it might not do that it might give a residual it close to it but not exact okay now that would mean that in your theory you have not in your model you have not accounted for something mm. something is missing mm. but you have to figure out what is that is missing there's some mystery in the mathematics of our solar system uh not mystery in the mathematics but something which is some component which is not fully accounted for okay. so that probably can give a residual and what are the yeah. theories that there is a black hole i think uh, uh, there is somewhere. a small particle which we are not able to detect or not able to uh, uh, properly get its orbit Okay so there are some i'm not very well sure about it what exactly it is but uh um i'm not able to recall what what exactly it is but there, there is a mismatch but then this is very small thing which is we are missing so we still have to figure that out yeah okay but one of the theories is that it could be another planet it could be a small uh, outside outside one but we can't say it's a planet or a dwarf planet Yeah, because wow. Pluto itself is a dwarf planet. But if we are able to know about all these random planets we find huh. so far away, all these X one two yes, three four yes, yes, planets, yes, yes, yes. how do we not know that there could be another planet in our own solar system which is so tightly packed? Yeah, yeah. So how do we find planets? Is one you have to find the the planets are not emitting light, so you have to get the light uh, detect reflected light detected. Okay, it's a highly precision based one. As in, there's a telescope on Earth which captures the image of the planets. Yeah. So how do we? The question is, you you uh, uh, you kind of alluded to how do we detect planets far away, right? Yeah. So it's a highly precision measurement. Let's say, give me. I'll give you a very simple example of it. Sure. Um, you say the Earth is going around the sun. Ah, uh, sun. But do you say sun is going around the Earth? No. Why? Because my science textbooks taught me the okay. other things. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I say yes, it is possible that we can say the sun is going around the Earth. So that is how you. I mean, you start doing science as you start questioning. Hmm. Okay. When there are two bodies which are going around each other, the science also tells you that they go around the center of something called mass. Huh? Center of mass. Like you, what is what is the why is the Earth going around the Sun? Because there are there are two bodies, right? One goes around the other. So why is the other one go around the? I mean the uh, the bigger one can why can't the bigger one go around the smaller one? So basically, if you consider two masses of same uh, same oh. mass, let's say two okay. bodies of same mass. Okay, okay, okay. I thought you when you said center of mass, no, no. I thought you meant Mars, the planet. No, no, ma mass is mass. Mass, yeah, the total mass. Huh. You have two objects of the same uh, mass. Okay. Yeah. Now, where will they go around? So they there is a center of mass, and they one will go around that center of mass. This also will go around the center of mass. Hmm. So it will go it. around like this. Okay. And because the difference in the mass of the Earth and the Sun is so big, exactly. the center of mass is much closer to the Sun. Yeah. Closer to the Sun, but not at the center of the Sun. Where is it? somewhere? On inside the, edge of the, the sun inside the sun yeah so actually the sun will go around that center of mass got it understood yeah so, so the sun is actually going around the center of mass wow that's a very small wobble right you yeah. can imagine a yeah, small kind of a jitter it right. will have small wobble right this is the wobble the telescopes have picked up of other stars mm understood it's a very small wobble wow So wow. you have to detect this extremely small wobble, and like I said, why is this wobble happening to this star? Why is this star just doing this? Hmm. It's because of some unseen thing going around it. Okay, I, yeah. I I understood exactly what you're saying, but let me just repeat it once for the viewers. Sure. Okay. So basically, according to the laws of gravitation, if there are two massive bodies, a planet and a star, um, you draw a line between the two. you take the mass of each of those now uh the obviously the star will have a much larger mass yes 
therefore it will pull the center of mass towards itself yes and both those bodies will rotate around that center of mass exactly now the planet is quite far away from that star so its radius of rotation will be much larger than that star which will actually have the center of mass within its own body because it's so heavy as a object so it has a slight vibration around that center of mass which is inside its own body Correct. now you're saying that when you look at other solar systems and other stars other star you're able to pick up that small vibration yeah some wobble yeah yeah because of which you're able to understand oh it's got an interference from other planets around it possibly yes. then you'll look for the other planets exactly that's, that's how... one one of the ways of looking at uh, okay yeah, yeah. okay so this is uh, important and uh, uh, so this what i'm saying is as the astro astronomy right now is extremely precision based hmm so this precision is what is telling us not only the detection but also estimation of what kind of planets it can have is one of the ways of detecting planets okay so this uh, this we can go quite deep like you know <laughs> small signatures differences you can uh, do and uh, uh, even with that uh, we have not detected the 10 i'm saying that uh, i just wanted to bring it out because uh it's not to do with the detection way in which you have to find out the we we know asteroids which move around so planets would mean that they are not like the stars moving they have a different type of orbits but they have to be very faint you have to pick it up okay. so that is why we are not able to detect anything beyond pluto even if it is there like the evade yeah the one the which is evading right the if it is there kind of a thing but we are detecting in terms of gravitation so mm. yeah. you think there's a limitation of our current mathematical methods and our current technology um yeah it could still be yeah the technology could still be improved to figure out how to how to oh, do wow. that but the technology is actually pushing the limit of things because even even the other method of detecting exoplanets is like uh, uh Uh, uh, the planet is a very small body and when the planet let's say you i don't know whether people have watched the transit of venus venus goes in front of the it's like a uh, uh, eclipse part but then the venus will go in front of the sun and move very very slowly okay so uh, that tran transit will be a small dot which will be move in front of the sun like that so when the actual the dot moves along the total brightness of the sun will be reduced by about 0.1% or 0.01% very very tiny bit but we are able to detect such variations in other systems mm. so that's a high precision high uh, i mean uh, you have to be very carefully estimating those uh, measurements so then that is how we are able to estimate it so it is not possible to even uh, we we the technology is advanced to the extent that we can actually measure this little deviations wow. though they existed before we and we were not able to measure so the technology is the key here got it i still find it so weird that we we figured out how to kind of map out distant star systems yeah. but whatever is near our own sun yes. we're not able to like yeah yeah so strange reality of science yes that's right yes okay uh what do you find very weird about our own solar system like what is very strange for you as a scientist i mean i don't know whether it is strange or not but um uh, the uh see we cannot say that is strange as of now because that is our uh Reality. our no no not only really a reality but that is our um uh, what do you say a model comparison model we have only one which is which we know it very well so we use this okay this is what we have now what is that what is out there what is out there so we don't have so much of details to say that this is wrong and that's correct or this is theoretically possible and that is something is wrong with our solar system so we still do not have okay. that much of information Can I ask you a science fictiony question? Yes. Sure. So we have the periodic table in chemistry. Yes. Uh we look at it with a viewpoint of it being complete, but could more elements be added? Uh yeah, actually if you look at this uh, periodic table, the elements are made in the stars. All the elements are made in the stars. The the elements which are being added up are human made uh, elements. but they are all very unstable they are all quite radioactive. massive radioactive they are very unstable elements okay so they will live only for very short period and then 
um they decay into more stable nuclei so there's no chance that we'll find a we, new when if we find we it's all for probably for academic purposes we can't use it for anything as such ah, yeah okay yeah okay all right but there would be uh, in nuclear fusion experiments there would be for short lifetime there would be some coming but then immediately they decay, decay down to uh stable nuclei quite okay. fast yeah okay I'm sorry we're deep diving so much into science. No, 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 no problem. Yes. How are you liking this conversation? Yeah, very interesting, very diverse because we are going from biology to, you know, chemistry to physics and okay. mathematics. It's very nice because uh, that's that's the way we see things around and we need to put them together in a kind of a framework. Yes. No, no, I'm glad, yeah. ma'am. I'm glad uh, Indian scientists are now being celebrated on the internet. That's one of my main goals with TRS. But I've got to create episodes based on what the audiences demand. Yeah. And I feel now people are ready for scientific That's conversation. Right. Yes, yes. You know, for yes. years, uh, people didn't want even knowledgeable conversation. Now yeah, people yeah. like podcasts. And within yeah. podcasts, they're liking these deep dives into yeah. chemistry, physics, biology, etc. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very um, nice, yes. I want to ask you what's the most fun part of your job as an astrophysicist. Um something I mean scientists generally will say that you know you fi- what is the thrill you get by doing it. It the thrill is that sometime you will find that you will be the first person to know that something about something. Nobody else in the world would know that about some star you see some you know. some some phenomena or some f- basic physics stuff oh my god this actually works or you know this actually exists mm. i thought it might but then it actually exists and i have the proof with it me so that that kind of a thrill is okay amazing yeah is there a part of you that has a small fear in your heart that one day you'll be looking into your massive telescope and you'll find like a meteor that's heading towards the earth have uh, you ever thought of this possibility yeah so meteorites the 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 small particles do come but then the you know the asteroids which come and kind of a strike kind of a thing but with the bigger telescopes of course that could have happened long back but right now with the kind of mapping we have of the sky we know, we will know its orbit very well ahead how much ahead uh to the extent that uh, i think we will know it in a few years ahead Okay. of that because we know we can trace its orbits okay. so right now like you know previously people used to think that okay i have taken the picture of this part of the sky why should i keep going back to that part of the sky to take pictures this sky is like you know it's uh, the stable. same yeah stable the same so there's no variation in the sky but now it is not so the uh, the massive stars erupt they call supernovae and that eruption happens in most of the galaxies everywhere previously uh, like about in 1980s or uh, uh, mid 80s 90s you would get about a handful of them you could detect a handful of them per year kind of a thing now there are like thousands of them because you know that they are going off and you need to study them so because you're going back and having the surveys to look at them you not only see them but a lot of other things these asteroids will move <laughs> faster so you can uh we, our telescope in uh, himalaya uh, himalayas we have a small one but even that detects a lot of asteroids so okay um the reason i'm bringing up asteroids especially for the audiences is because i don't think people understand how dangerous massive asteroids can be for the yes, earth yes. it's the equivalent of a human being being shot with a bullet um that's the kind of speed asteroids hit you with so even an asteroid the size of say um a city could actually create a lot of apocalyptic events uh, yeah. on earth and there are asteroids which are as big as cities out there yes uh the speed with which they can hit the earth can create effects on the other side of the earth as well that's how impactful an asteroid impact can be and that's what destroyed the dinosaurs yes they there are theories about something called the younger dryas impact theory which i've spoken about a lot on the show are you familiar with this like yeah yeah around 11000 12000 yeah yeah Uh, BC apparently a massive asteroid had hit yes. the earth which has given rise to all these stories of Noah's ark and Gilgamesh and <laughs> even in India we have Manu's story yeah. uh, that massive floods took over the earth yeah uh, so this is a possibility for the human race living on earth that we can be hit with an asteroid which is why i want to ask you as a scientist that say we able to detect an asteroid which is going to hit the earth yeah. the protocol will be to nuke it like to send an atom bomb and destroy it before it hits the earth yeah so there was a mission recently called a dart mission by nasa 
so that mission uh, actually uh, uh, was targeted to an asteroid and then they actually crashed the uh, spacecraft onto the dart uh, sorry onto the asteroid okay to see how much they can deviate its uh, orbit path so they could actually successfully crash crash it and then deviate its path it actually moved, moved. away uh, it's deviated its path how much i am not uh, uh, not able to remember but this is a serious mission not new kid but uh, change its orbit so that okay. it doesn't come and do it so this is already tested yeah okay if we actually throw a nuclear bomb onto one of the asteroids out there what will happen it will just get destroyed fully like yeah so you will create a lot of uh, debris and then you'll have to figure out how these debris <laughs> take care of all this debris but if it's yeah. actually debris like see say that city sized asteroid that you're destroying with an atom bomb hmm. uh, you're creating much smaller asteroids from it yes. now those smaller asteroids will melt away in the earth's atmosphere right when they enter they should melt away but then when you are actually navigating they will all cause problems like what uh, when you are spacecraft is navigating and if you do not know things they can come and crash onto the experiment or spacecraft or your uh, um what do you say the solar panels okay so they can actually destroy it so right now you you know the asteroid uh, or, or or the bigger sized objects out there and then you need to avoid them when you do a deep sea sorry deep space uh, um, voyages and all that but if you create certain uh, uh, plumes around it even a small particles can damage the spacecraft okay yeah <laughs> so we are actually dealing with a lot of space debris in and around uh, uh, earth but this can cause a lot of debris beyond space what is space say. debris space debris is uh, like unused satellites which still orbiting around As they're in all uh, the dead bodies uh, yeah dead instruments which is still orbiting we don't we have lost control we have lost communication with it but still out there and that is uh, uh, we do not know its position what exactly it is so it can there are many place many times where our our own isro spacecrafts are to be uh, changed its uh, height etc to avoid collision huh? anti collision maneuvers yeah okay wow so that's a big uh, menace now and what's the solution the solution is uh, uh, first one is to identify what is existing there and do a clean up if possible or at least know where they are and second don't create more mm. so uh, the new missions there there has to be much more uh, guidelines etc et regarding how do you how you actually decommission a uh, your spacecraft so the low earth orbit if you look at about 300 kilometers or something like that they actually deorbit and burn in the atmosphere but the higher ones you go it is still uh, uh, they left there and causing problems causing problems and there are now uh, worldwide networks of telescopes and detection mechanisms where you can actually detect these smaller pieces get their orbit and predict where they can be but i'm sure this will cost money and maybe the world's governments are not ready to spend money on a problem that's up there i'm assuming that that's the issue no actually it is becoming more because we are getting some satellites damaged and okay. uh, you can't afford to do that okay so even uh, in india also there are efforts then there are specific telescopes being set up to monitor the space debris and not only monitor actually there are even mm, startups and companies trying to model it and sell that this is the data we we have the data but we can actually give you the model and coordinates of the space debris okay so um, this is a yeah interesting the, area i want to know a little bit about this whole space tech uh startup hmm. uh conversation you hear a lot of entrepreneurs throwing around that word india has a lot of space tech yes. startups yes what are, are they building they are building multiple things they have some are building uh, cameras which can look down on the earth and earth observation and things like that there are also startups building a uh, uh, communication because there's still if you want to have a spacecraft up there you need to communicate with it so you need to have communication mechanisms from the ground to the spacecraft so is the customer like just isro and the indian government and other governments of the world and other space agencies uh right now all these area have been under government okay, okay. starting from building a, a rocket 
sending a rocket, communicating with it, operating it and getting all the data from it. Everything was government based. Now you need to have all this uh, individual items I listed out have to be uh, built uh, in the uh, uh, industry as well. Because um, if you want to have multiple number of missions more and then you have to have communication networks more then only one agency cannot do it. There's a lot of opportunity there. You need to have multiple set of people looking into it. Even if you look at this Chandrayaan and uh, Aditya L1 mission, the communication with the uh, spacecraft when it was orbiting and changing the orbits, etc. had to be, uh, uh, you have to network with NASA and ESA and, uh, you know, antennas. These communication are uh, very uh, safe communications and uh, uh, with certain bandwidth allocated for that. But these communication networks are also people are trying to understand and how to build it. And of course, the rocket uh, uh, propulsion with uh, even electric propulsion is being tried out. So various other things and uh, uh, all these sectors are tried out. I think yeah. there's a lot of scope to... A lot of scope. Uh, help your country's space agency and exactly. your country's government exactly. explore space further. Exactly. Okay. There are certain areas where you need to have many more of them and also innovate in a different way. Build in a different way. Okay. Yeah. Can anyone get into a space tech space uh, he it is it is very highly fascinating but it is also a lot of hard work and a lot of uh, uh, iterations because the way you know we succeeded in landing on the moon it is not a uh, joke and you need to be very ready to face failures and learn from it and move forward mm. and many of these experiments are very long drawn and every time you have to have critical, you know, evaluation. And if it is not performing up to the mark, even 0.1 or 0.01 percentage, you have to say, no, there is a problem. Step back, correct it, and then only move. So it's quite painful, painstaking and long drawn. It's very R&D based, R &D, very yeah. product focused. And yes. the money you'll make will only be in the end after your project is complete. Yes, but then there are a lot of other byproducts you can get because the technology you are developing and then the techniques you are developing can be applied to very many areas. Okay. So, so those things are possible, definitely possible. But it is, it's a lot of um, deep tech. Um, let's go back to astronomy. Okay. Uh, you know, when I want to impress a group of people, and usually it's maybe some girls are also in that group, uh, I will look up... And the only part of astronomy that I understand is Orion's belt because it's yeah. so identifiable. The three yeah, stars yeah. are just like in one line. Right. Firstly, I find that very weird that three stars are in one line. Is that is that a weird thing? Have you ever looked at that and asked yourself, why is it in one line like that? There's another three three stars in one line inside Orion itself. No, Orion's dagger is three lines. So it's the pattern. You have a statistical way in which looking at it. It's, it's, I don't think it's weird, but I, I don't yeah. know. I, I find it extremely strange yeah, how straight that line yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, I almost look at it from a bit of a spiritual bent. Okay. That like, <laughs> why is it so straight as compared to all the other stars? So I actually got into some spiritual reading related to Orion's belt. Okay. And uh, I, again, this is very conspiracy theory zone, but I'm just telling you because now we're sure, having an sure. open-ended conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I found out that uh, there's something called the Sirius star system. Sirius is a star, yes. Is that near Orion's belt or? Uh, see, first of all, you should know. I mean, I'm just say, saying that these stars are project projected in the sky. They are not at the same distance. What? They are not at the same distance. They can be at different distances. Oh, you all mean all the three are not at the same distance, like ah. one, two, three. It they could be look... one very far away. For ah. you, it's all projected. Got it. Yeah. As in the the vision you see is all three of them in one line, yeah. but actually they're at very different depths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Sirius is another one, which is a, a, it's a binary system. They got two Sirius A and B. There okay. are two stars it's got. Yeah. Okay. So I, in the spiritual conspiracy mm -hmm. theories, I found out that uh, it's something related to the alignment of the pyramids as well. Like the pyramids were made to point towards, I believe the Sirius star system. And there is in your end, yeah. a set of uh, pyramids, which was uh, constructed to point at Orion's belt, to represent Orion's belt. Yeah, so what I have understood with this Orion, connection between Orion and the pyramids of Egypt is that the Nile floods in a particular uh, uh, season. 
so they wanted to figure out when there's orion rises in the east Ooh. that is when the nile floods okay. so their calendar and then the identifying the there are some particular holes in that directly you can see at that position orion coming up as in in the pyramids they've constructed I holes i think so yeah that is the alignment in which so we there are a lot of other things like stone hinges and lot of uh, objects are there older older uh, systems but here this particular thing is to uh, look at the flood it is related to the flooding of the nile okay wow yeah so time travel ma'am uh, should we begin by talking about interstellar have you watched interstellar yeah 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 i have watched interstellar yes did you yes. like the film yeah yeah it's a nice movie yes yes <laughs> as an astrophysicist why did you like interstellar um see even for an astrophysicist you need imagination to look at what exactly uh, it would be right out there hmm. so um uh, i mean you are a person so you will have your own visualization of how things are out there etc so when you look at things which are uh, put out by somebody else uh, with some context with some storyline of course is nice to see that so i think one of the pictures which i watched okay yeah, yeah. all right uh is time travel something that comes up in your field of study at all do you all ever kind of ponder upon it do you all do mathematics around it because wormholes as a concept have come up a lot on the show where i know that a lot of audience members probably at this point know what a wormhole is for those of you who don't uh think of space like physical space or even outer space as a sheet of paper now if you draw two points at the two corners of the paper and draw a line that goes between those two points that's the kind of distance it would take for you to get from earth's star system to even like the nearest star system which is light years away but what if i take one corner and then take the other corner and then fold the paper now those two points are touching each other you can actually do this with space theoretically speaking speaking from the perspective of astrophysics you can possibly do this so mathematically wormholes are a possibility but practically they're not a possibility because the nature of a wormhole is such that when you pass through it the wormhole collapses am i right am i wrong is a very raw understanding of what a wormhole is yeah i'm not Uh, familiar i mean not uh, scientifically familiar with wormholes but the point is that the um uh, the uh, theoretical predictions are many oh many things can be done so cosmology for that matter was also theoretically uh, various ways you know how the universe would expand forever or collapse in one time or go you know b- bouncing back and forth what is cosmology so, in the sense that universe in the sense that if you look at the universe whether the universe is constantly expanding and uh, the nearby stars will ever you know uh, say get separated over a time scale or you know they come back and collapse in the distance kinds of after a while it uh, reduces or just moves back and forth kind of a thing but now we know that you know there are we are expanding and there are uh, the future there was i mean there was a big bang and then a, a expansion t- takes place etc 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 but these are all evidence based so we rely on a lot of experiments and then do that so but at the same time there are a lot of theories which you need to be ready for if it is like this then it should be the way it is universe is like this similarly out there to uh, to explain various kind of cosmological features you can put out various theories but there are experiments which will say that okay only within the framework only these theories are possibly correct but these are not we are not in any position to evaluate string theory wormholes <laughs> etc etc right now as in theoretically speaking Theor- there's a lot of lot places of mathematics takes you yeah exactly but practically speaking yes. engineering can't create those yeah, possibilities yeah, right. at least where we are for now exactly so you you as you said if you look at an analogy of paper folding you have this paper and you ha- you cannot fold it on a large large scale right so you have something has to be seriously happening to make it fold or whatever so change the uh, space time environment right now you are in mm. so we understand space time environment for that matter the gravitational waves which were people used to be predicting and we would not we we thought that will not be detecting them but then now we are able to detect gravitational waves so we know that there is a space time fabric they can get uh, you know disturbed by these uh, 
uh, events, the merger events. Uh, uh, so we are able to detect them as well. So the technology is moving forward in understanding this fabric, but then we don't have any way of like, figuring out a uh, techni technologically how actually you can connect. But then uh, uh, there are time travel is, we don't talk in terms of the outcomes of such e things, but then we talk in terms of development, which can actually detect or do something. But at some times that outcome can come, but we are nowhere near to it at all. How because, far are we? Um, I don't know because <laughs> 10 years ago when we said, okay, gravitational waves, can we detect? Maybe we can detect, but we detected it. So we need probably, I don't know, some uh, experiments have to be, uh, I, I don't know. I'm completely lost at this point okay. to, regarding that. Yeah. yeah, This is what I appreciate about yes, scientists. Yes, yeah. that <laughs> scientists are very honest about where the limitations of science are at this point. Yeah, yeah. Theoretically speaking, could there be wormholes out there in outer space already? Because one of the theories is that, hey, could a black hole actually be a wormhole? Like if you actually go into a black hole, you everyone knows that whole spaghettification thing that you'll be you'll be killed by the black hole. Basically, you'll be stretched and killed. Uh, that's what theoretically happens. But yes. no one's actually tried to go inside a black hole, and that's yeah. where this whole interstellar yeah. uh, climax also comes in play. Sorry, spoilers. Um, Go watch the movie or stop this podcast right now and then come back after you've seen the movie. And for those of you who've watched the movie, three, two, one, we're back. At the end of Interstellar, when he goes into that black hole, he's transported to another dimension. Uh, that's what I loved about that film, that it just kind of sparked off the imagination of science fans all over the world. That, hey, this is what could possibly happen. Maybe you're transported to another dimension. You don't actually die in a black hole. Have you ever thought of this? Have you ever thought of black holes being sort of wormholes? So I know another theory is that we see a black hole, maybe on the other side of a black hole is a white hole. That which opens up to another universe or another dimension. What do you have to say, ma'am? I'm just like throwing out all the science fiction stuff I know and waiting for you to say, yeah, this is probably possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's interesting see black hole has been uh, the uh, you know uh, fascinating topic for various reasons basically because it's a huge unknown out there and the capability of physics and mathematics get stretched so what we as physicists and scientists are more worried about the framework of whether when you say something is actually valid you need better framework to address that condition so when we even get an outcome, we first suspect that it is an artifact of something which is not properly taken care. As in the science has not been taken care of. Yeah. So something, some, some factor you're missing out there, which is not really you have missed out. So scientists get into this framework of, you know, whenever your result is, you have got a result, probably it is very exciting, but then first you have to make sure that that actually is valid physically and mathematically. Now, these are areas where they are all at the at the periphery. Okay. So one first one looks at that the result you've got is actually correct. And then you move on to something. So that itself takes a quite a bit of time time okay. to understand. So there are millions of possibilities out there, what is possible or not. But in a movie, you can actually find the very nice way to project it that this is one of the possible ways where you can bring it a, a person out of th through the black hole out to the other side kind of a thing. But then in reality, what the matter ha is there, what is the condition of the matter there? It's in, um, um, you know, it's in plasma form, it's hot, whatever magnetic fields, everything is very complex there out there. Okay. And dynamics and the uh, space-time curvature. So by the time you get all these parameters and solve it is like a major mess. Okay. <laughs> were you angry when you were watching Interstellar and the climax? No, it is, no, not angry. It's like, uh, it's, it's, for me, it's like a science fiction. But you have to kind of suppress your uh, uh, scientist, scientist uh, evaluation. You just <laughs> keep and stop thinking in that light. Just look at it as a story and enjoy like it. Like we yes, saw yeah. Interstellar as Nolan's best film. You saw it as a Govinda film. <laughs> no, no, not like that. But it's like a nice depiction of something which, which can be pos one of the million possibilities. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just a possibility. Okay what is the closest black hole to earth or oh, we don't know because you can't see it 
the black holes are of different types like you know stellar black holes where like you know this serious case where you have a star and a white dwarf white dwarf is basically the remnant of a star but if the like the supernova was talking about the big star which explodes the remnant is a could be a black hole black hole is what physics mean, means that the density is so high that the light cannot escape you cannot see it so you have to detect it in a indirect fashion so you can be a star there's a star which is going just like the two mass thing which is going around we're talking about right the yeah. earth and the sun kind of a thing the same kind of a system binary stars are there where this the star which is going around the invisible black hole ah yeah so that is how we estimate that there is a huge mass present in a small volume that could be a wow uh, uh, black hole but there are also centers of galaxies like our own galaxies galactic center as huge black holes again how do you estimate the mass of it again the stars go around it one has to figure out the speed with which it is going find the orbit and then using just uh, uh, normal uh, gravitation laws you can actually get the mass estimation of that So, so these are all this two body system which you talked about is actually relevant in many places so yeah. there are star systems out there yeah. where stars bigger than our sun Much are revolving than... around something yes that's a possibility of the existence of a black hole um yeah the st- the, the the star which has been extremely massive collapsed exploded and the inner part collapsed resulting in a black hole but there would be some binary system where another star was ro- going around it which did not get disrupted in the process but still continues to go around the system okay and we measure the dynamics of it and then that is how we uh, say that yes there is a possibility for black hole there okay so such systems only in terms of binary we find but not in terms of a singular uh, black hole floating around kind of okay. thing yes okay so uh, are there scientists in the world who are dedicated to just studying black holes yeah how do you study it you see the movement of the star around it yeah so there are two ways mostly before the observations thing came about black hole studies a lot of theoretical studies like you know how a black hole can exist and what are the even horizon the uh, solving the equation physics equations and putting the magnetic fields etc etc all the the space time curvature and all that so the huge amount of people large groups are there who study this black holes uh in fact this i think it was a, a couple of years ago the nobel prize went and two two sets of people one is for the theoretical part of it the other is for the experimental part of it so both sides are equally strong and the experimental part takes a lot of time because you need to actually measure the uh, movements of the stars around going around and painstakingly do it so the nobel prize which awarded to the experimental set of people was measurement taken over 20 years <sighs> Yeah so if you look at towards the galactic center towards our center of the galaxy it's totally crowded too many stars out there so you have to actually have something called a, a, a adaptive optics where high resolution you need to figure out the each and every star separate out and identify its motion and it's a painstaking process so astronomy uh, historically is a very painstaking job because it takes a long time you look at the planetary motions you need years and years of data you have to collect test cricket of science <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah you're right okay yeah so you have to be very patient with each and every ball in the test cricket so you just hit that he did so similarly you need to actually patiently look at the observe take the data take the data today tomorrow day take the data next year year wise then you actually compile everything so this is 20 years of data which actually created the entire orbit around this central black hole of our galaxy and then estimate the mass so black hole has been fascinating for quite some time for various reasons this whole thing that elon musk keeps saying about how eventually human civilization has to leave earth and move on to other planets and become intergalactic and all that is that just a science fiction angle or do you also agree as an astrophysicist based on the climate change that we see on earth today see uh, i i don't know where we are heading to but unless we have we have to have clear uh, controls and things like that because we are seeing the impact of uh, climate change a very drastic um, impact is going on right now but leaving totally earth i'm not sure but then definitely a uh, possibility of uh, you know habit uh, um, uh, getting to other planets and 
making uh, living possible there is definitely possible in the next uh, maybe 20 30 years kind of a thing Ooh. but after that i do not know you say 20 30 years and i've gotten to know you now ma'am and everything that you say with surety <laughs> is with science as a base yes yes so when you are saying 20 30 years <laughs> it should be definitely possible because we are already uh, uh, in uh, international space station for so, so such a long time so we should be able to uh, take and with the moon mission so many of the moon missions coming out now technology rapidly uh, advancing it should be definitely possible to at least uh, humans going to mars etc but then um, colonizing that will take time and then the depend on the expansion or rather the um, mobility factor and then how much we can we are able to spend money on it etc etc because cost is a prohibitive factor yeah but it is it's not i mean if you even if you look at 5 years back it's not the way in uh, now right we have actually caught up with a lot of uh, uh, technology and things we can actually do it So it it should be possible in two, a couple of decades. You know this whole space travel thing, like Jeff Bezos is starting a space travel company, mm. Virgin Galactic, mm. Elon Correct. Musk. Correct. It scares me. I don't know if I would want. I I mean I obviously want that experience of going through space, but it's it just scares me a little bit. Like, have you seen Gravity, the movie? Yeah, yeah. It's this one of the <laughs> most uncomfortable, beautiful but uncomfortable yeah. movies that I've ever seen in my life. And I highly recommend Gravity to everyone who's not mm-hmm. seen it. It's about astronauts who get lost in space yeah. and how they figure out yeah, how to, to like how to come, come back, back to it. Yes, yeah. It's the most uncomfortable movie you'll watch, and you'll feel like you're in space while you watch that movie. But anyway, yeah. Like, does it scare you? Like, if no, you would go for a. It is not very high, actually. It is not. <laughs> I mean, the kind of distances you talk about, it is not very high. You actually looking go go to about eighty kilometers, hundred kilometers thing of thing, and then come back. International space station is. Three hundred kilometers, three hundred, three hundred fifty kilometers. So, it's not it's not much, and it should be doable. I mean, right now we have we have already seen multiple agencies doing it. So, would you go? Yes, but you need to be fit enough and go through all these things to. Oh, I I hope. I mean, if I get a chance, definitely I would go and come. Why? Back, it's an experience to see the Earth from above, which you have not uh, seen, and that's that's a completely different experience. So. Uh, terrestrial there are experiences like you know the other experience will be to go down the ocean that's also actually equally uh, like interesting like that titanic uh, yeah. <laughs> submarine <laughs> no no it's quite quite a d- d- deep in there so yeah. titanic submarine style story scare me away from like this whole elon musk oh, okay, space okay, travel okay, thing like okay, what yeah, if something, no, no, something goes, wrong goes wrong up yeah, there yeah, that's right no. no no the technology right now like you know air travel you know earlier just going by uh, airplanes was not that safe right but now it's not that you have too many uh, everybody anybody can fly now so it's it's not only really about affordability it's also about uh, safety technology technology and we have achieved it so this should also be possible in um, uh, in a decade or so it's, it should be definitely possible yeah when you're saying this whole thing about colonizing the moon i'm assuming that the moon is the first stop that people are looking at for colonization yeah. colonization more than that it's a it's a resource center not like a colonization colonization probably mars is a better place Ooh, than really? than uh, uh, gravity is there better and then uh, like, uh, it's slightly better to land easier to land in mars than in moon moon is a resource center basically not like a uh, yeah colony colony yeah wow. that's what i think yes wow Okay, because again, gravity, all that—it's too different from Earth. It's the resources. Yeah. At the end of the day, we have a human body that we're limited by. Mm, yeah. So Mars is better for colonization than. How do you begin to colonize Mars? I know Elon Musk on one Joe Rogan mm-hmm. podcast. He said that you basically just heat up a planet. <laughs> that's how. <laughs> that's how. That's what terraforming is. Like when you're trying to establish a yes, city, yes. just heat, heat up a planet. Heat, yes. But it's difficult to heat up a whole planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So you have to do piece by piece. <laughs> that's that's the effect of science right um uh, yeah so you need to have a uh, heat up as well as you need to have enough uh, the required uh, gases so to start the whole thing yeah oxygen yeah. so you have to figure a way to create oxygen nitrogen all that on yes. that planet yes yes but then why are you saying we're 20 30 years away No, no. So one for first, this thing is that you uh, space. Uh, though the technology is uh, ramping up quite fast, 
the uh, each mission time scale is a bit um, takes time because you once you have done it you can probably go very first time you need to make sure that everything is tested properly and you know the way you do it properly and then once you execute it now you can do it because you know what you have done correctly so then you can replicate it faster but then the first time it takes much longer and safety because when you are uh, taking human beings and it has the safety is of paramount in, uh, importance there so that uh, conditions have to be met so the first time it will take time but then once you do like you know the kind of experiments like why now we landed on the moon but then we also try to hop hmm so uh, you have to keep keep multiple do doing multiple things like you now the artemis series of missions which are going they will do a huge number of experiments down the line right so there then the humans actually going there will take place in a couple of years time so that to the moon back to the moon now mars so many rovers are there on the moon, uh, mars surface already so now you have actually known multiple things and you have mapped the surface and understanding of where exactly what is the material and things like that a lot of data has come come already so that will be the uh, layer on which we are standing on that particular foundation and trying to figure out what can be done next okay yeah so it's a step by step procedure step -by -step process, yes. lot of experiments getting yes. data getting the soil Get, getting um, understanding of what it is what can be done how it can be done where it can be done all these have to be answered first before you actually do it so there's no way you can visualize a colony of human beings right now we don't know whether we'll live mm -hmm. inside a dome on mars or we'll actually terraform the full planet um no we'll have to do a little bit and test it out and figure out how to do that so but a, a lot of ideas yeah a <laughs> yeah. dome is yeah, like small likely. areas likely to be yeah smaller area to begin with i do not know i'm just i am also running my ideas okay. imagination wild Okay. Yeah. No, right. that's what TRS yeah, is yeah. about, ma'am. <laughs> right. How do you get that bigger glass enclosure up in Mars? <laughs> you, it may not be glass. I do not know. So it may not be glass. Yeah, yeah. So we have to figure out an inflatable thing, and also, Ooh. yeah, I, I, I mean, you have to take it out there, right? Glass carrying glass and putting it there. Damn. I do not know. So we'll have to have a. Some amount of greenhouse effect to make sure that things grow inside. Yeah. You know what scares me about inflatable? Yeah. Some kid goes and this like stabs. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing collapses. Yes, Everyone yes, dies yeah, on yeah, Mars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. But we we'll have to uh, material which you can actually transport and then actually set it up there and things like that. I think we'll have to. Oh, there are a lot of material research also goes on. So uh, we'll figure it out. I, what I'm saying is that the the required technology, the required ideas, the required. material um, how you make that they're all uh, maturing mm. so as i said if you want to do something there are multiple things we need to mature uh, simultaneously to actually achieve it and that is actually maturing so that is why i'm saying it is possible okay dr subramaniam this was great <laughs> thank you <laughs> i hope you had fun a lot of fun yeah okay that's it from all my science fiction questions uh, today Something tells me in my heart that this is not the last time we are meeting. All right. So please return on the show soon. Definitely. And yeah. uh, I hope you had fun on yeah, today's episode. Yeah, I had episode. fun. Quite a bit of fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I will you so much. See you soon again in life. Thanks for the education. Very few guests leave me feeling so stimulated. Okay. So thank you so much, ma'am. I really Thanks appreciate. Thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome right. having you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's it from our science special of TRS. These are the episodes I probably look forward to the most. I don't need to prep much for these because. it's my subject it's the closest subject to my heart it's one of the close subjects amongst all these other trs subjects that we have please give me your other recommendations when it comes to scientists i'd like to know who else you'd like to see on trs is the age of celebrating indian science it's the age of celebrating astrophysics and trs is going to be back soon with even more science themed episodes mm -hmm.